Look in favor upon Chris and Laura, and grant that they, rejoicing in all of your gifts, may at length celebrate with Christ the marriage feast which has no end. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And at this time, our service continues with the readings. And we're 
maybe a little jealous of, and your share of the love of which Hedgeberg jokes was abundant, which by the way, I'm like a donut, we are going to bring paper and ink into this. <laughs> I remember leaving Uncle Bill's Pancake House that day, feeling so happy for you, Laura, and having a sense that there was indeed something different, something wonderful, and something beautiful about this relationship. And it was confirmed when I had the opportunity to meet Chris and spend some time with him. And it was so evident, it was so evident that the love of Christ was what had brought the two of you together. And so it is an honor and a blessing to be here on this day to celebrate your marriage with you. As we learn in movies like When Harry Met Sally, yes, relationships are crazy, messy, intricate little beasts, aren't they? And individual lives are no less crazy, no less messy, and no less intricate. We all have previous experiences which felt a little crazy, felt a little messy, and were definitely intricate and sometimes even painful. So when two of these lives intersect and a new relationship is formed, we can rest assured in knowing that it too will definitely sometimes be a little crazy and be a little messy, and it will be a little intricate too. And Martin Luther himself knew that. In the large catechism, when he writes about marriage, he says that while it's a civil institution, it is one that carries the very word of God, and it is not something to be taken lightly. That marriage is tough. That marriage faces tough stuff. And so all the more reason that we should all gather here together in this place as children of God and as brothers and sisters in Christ to bless your union, and to shower you with prayers and blessings for your marriage. And so we're all here gathered today to do just that. We just heard the wonderful text that you both selected, and this whole community that has gathered here to celebrate with you is reminded of the very thing that brings any of us into this place, the very thing that brings any of us into any kind of love, and that is the love of God, experienced through Christ. And I know that this love is no stranger to either of you. In preparing for today, I asked you both some questions, one of which was, what is your favorite thing about the other person? And Chris named Laura's joyfulness, her ability to see the good in everyone, and her keen sense of empathy and love for others. And Laura named Chris's kindness, and the way in which he never fails to make her feel loved. Kindness and joyfulness and love. I cannot think of three better ingredients to guide your marriage. All three of these can be found in the same place, of course, through God, the Father, and the Son, Jesus Christ. We hear today a simple way that leads to this kind of love, and it is by abiding in God. To abide in God is to love. To abide in God is to participate in the kind of relationship that Jesus offers to each of us, a relationship where we're willing to lay down our very lives for the other, the kind of relationship where we're not just willing, but we desire to put the other before ourselves. It is in this sacrificial kind of loving that we experience what it means to abide in God. To abide in God is to love, and to love is to abide in God. We encounter this gospel text from John following the Last Supper, and particularly following when he washes the feet of his disciples. The Savior of the world bends down and willfully washes the stinky, grimy feet of his friends. That is some sacrificial kind of love right there. That is dirty and grimy and stinky kind of love, and, it, and it's the same kind of love that each one of us are called to every day. And it's not just dirty and stinky, but it is intimate. And this kind of intimate love has tremendous and beautiful consequences. This is the kind of love that builds an unshakable trust. And I know that that's something that both Laura and Chris have worked together hard to rebuild and to work on. And it's taken getting through some fears to rebuild that. Because loving can be scary. It is scary to think that you might give all that you are to another person and they might take it for granted or not want that love or get bored with that love. And so again, we turn to the relationship of God the Father and Jesus the Son at the very, as the very definition of a love that conquers fear. At a love that conquers 
comes here because Jesus took on the ultimate fear, the fear of death and dying. And Jesus conquered that fear in the resurrection where life and love is the final word. It's the final victory. And so we cast our fears onto him who holds them, conquers them, and then says, come and abide in me. I got this. The reality is that left to our own devices, love is impossible. Left to our own devices, marriage would be ridiculous. But held together in Christ, the impossible becomes possible and the ridiculous becomes extraordinary. Held together in Christ, what does that look like? Well, when I was thinking of those precious old couples from the movie, with Harry Met Sickly, I was reminded of a particular older couple that I had met during my time here at Trinity. Chuck and Joyce Parrott had been married for over 60 years, and they had the opportunity to share some of their experience with the congregation one day. They have seen it all. They've suffered great sorrow in the death of multiple children. They've celebrated great joys in new jobs and travels and children and grandchildren. And they were invited to share about that. And what they said that day has been etched in my mind ever since. They brought an image for it, and they explained their love and their marriage as a braid. Now, if you've ever had sisters, or if you grew up hiking or camping, you can picture a braid or a rope. And you can probably picture that in your mind. Whether it's hair or a rope, you probably know that to make a strong braid or a strong rope, you have to have at least three strands. But when you look at the braid, it appears that there are only two. But if there were actually only two, it would quickly unravel and the structure would fail. It's because of the third strand that the braid has stability and structure. It's the third strand that holds it all together. The third strand is what keeps little girls' braids from flinging unravel in their new cartwheels. And it's the third strand of rope that is what provides security to the mountain climber. Chuck and Joyce understood well, the necessity of the third strand of their marriage. And if it had not been for their third strand, the third member of their marriage, then it would have quickly unraveled during those times of sorrow and despair. Chuck was only one strand, and Joyce was only another. The two that people saw, but at the center, weaving in and through them, making them strong and helping them to endure, was the abiding strand of Christ. Christ could bear the load of deep sorrow, and celebrate with them in moments of pure joy. There in the center was this abiding presence, often unseen, sometimes hard to feel, but always steadily there, keeping it together. As you heard earlier, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I shared with both of you how honored I was to participate in a marriage where I knew without a, a doubt that God was at the center of it, that God had brought you together. I know that God has planted himself at the very center of your relationship, and so I encourage you to cling to it. Cling to it when Chris's seeming inability to plan ahead drives me nuts. <laughs> cling to it the 37th time that Laura Googles her health symptoms <laughs> instead of asking her own father. <laughs> Cling to it when the first devastating loss strikes you as a couple, because it will. And cling and swing from it when God blesses you with great joy, because God will. Your marriage is a unique opportunity to be the gospel. You are invited in this marriage to be the love of Christ, not only to one another, but to model it for the world around you. What love really is and what it looks like. Because the world is hungry for that kind of love. It's starving for it, actually. And your marriage is an invitation to spread the love of Christ. Take a look around you. Go ahead do it. <laughs> These are the people who God has already placed in your life. They are people who have helped both of you learn what it is to love one another. And here today they're going to make their own promises to you and to one another to uphold your marriage, to love and support you, the help of Jesus Christ and his abiding love. Your marriage today is a beautiful reminder of the kind and joyful and graceful love that Christ blesses each one of us with every day. 
And he not only blesses us with it, but invites us to share it with the world. What we've heard today and what we witness in your marriage serves as a reminder, an important reminder to all of us gathered, that we never grow beyond the need to hear again the good news of God's love in Christ. May that love sustain all who are gathered here today. May that love rekindle marriages that are stressed on this day. May that love abide in all of the relationships we have here today. And may that love sustain us all as Christian brothers and sisters. Amen. The Lord God, in his goodness, created us male and female, and by the, gift of, by the gift of marriage, founded human community in a joy that begins now and is brought to perfection in the life to come. Because of sin, our age-old rebellion, the gladness of marriage can be overcast, and the gift of family can become a burden. But because God, who established marriage, continues still to bless it with his abundant and ever-present support, we can be sustained in our weariness and have our joy restored. Chris and Laura, if it is your intent to join with each other as husband and wife, I ask now that you do the vows. Will the congregation please rise? And now, Chris, repeat after me. I take you, Laura. I take you, Laura. To be my wife. To be my wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better. For worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, till death do us part. Laura, repeat after me. I take you, Chris. I take you, Chris. To be my husband. To be my husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Chris, will you please take the ring? Place it on the third finger of her left hand. And now repeat after me, I give you this ring. I give you this ring. As a sign of my love and faithfulness. As a sign of my love and faithfulness. Laura, will you please take the ring? Place it on the third finger of his left hand. And now repeat after me, I give you this ring. I give you this ring. As a sign of my love and faithfulness. As a sign of my love and faithfulness. Chris and Laura, by their promises before God and in the presence of this congregation, have bound themselves to one another as husband and wife. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those whom God has joined together. Let no one put asunder. Amen. The congregation may be seated. At this time, the service continues with the lighting of the unity candle. Laura and Chris have asked that their families be a very special part of their unity candle celebration.
Us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Here at Trinity, we teach, preach, and believe that Jesus Christ truly meets us in, with, and under this bread and this wine. This morning we will commune by intention. The ushers will escort you forward. You will receive the bread in the hand. There will be a chalice of wine on either side of the altar. Once you receive the bread, we simply ask that you dip the bread into the chalice and return to your seat. Communion is open to all baptized believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you would not like to receive communion, but you would like to receive a blessing, we ask that you please come forward like this, and Annie and I will bless you. Please 
yourself to your bride, the church, grant that the mystery of the union of man and woman in marriage may reveal to the world the self-giving love which you have for your church, and to you with the Father and the Holy Spirit be glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now the Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit keep you in his light, his truth, and his love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may kiss the bride. <laughs>
time.